Hello, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Welding, Cutting, and Brazing Safety, sponsored by Miller Electric. My name is Kyle Morrison. I'm the Senior Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The views of the speakers and their organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Mention of any commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorse them. At the end of today's webcast, we'll have a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, then click the Submit Question button. You can feel free to ask your question at any point during the presentation. You don't need to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible, but due to the large number of participants, we may not be able to answer all the questions live during our presentation. However, any unanswered question will be forwarded on to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, please click the Help button located on your screen. The webcast will be archived for three months, so you can access it after today's live presentation. Within about a day, just return to this URL to access the webcast. With that, I think we're ready to begin. We have three speakers with us today. Bert Schiller is an industrial hygienist with more than 35 years of experience evaluating welding fume exposures throughout several industries. Kathy Abshire is the safety sales specialist for Miller Electric and has more than 30 years of experience in the occupational safety and health industry. And Dale Johnson has been involved in workplace safety since the late 70s and is currently the commercial district manager for the Dakotas and Minnesota. Bert? Thank you. Before we begin, we should remember that every welding environment is unique with physical and health concerns and needs to be evaluated by a qualified professional, either a safety professional or a certified industrial hygienist. They will be able to determine the appropriate course of action for regulatory compliance and risk reduction. This presentation is intended for awareness and introductory purposes only and should not be used to replace professional consultation or complete review of the owner's manual. In order to assess the potential health and safety risks associated with welding, cutting, and brazing, it's important to become familiar with the pertinent health and safety regulations and standards. First, let's identify some of the key agencies and organizations that have, have a role in occupational health and safety. First of all, OSHA, everyone's familiar with, a federal agency, part of the U.S. Department of Labor, responsible for the establishment and enforcement of health and safety regulations. You may not be aware, however, that there's both state and federal programs. About half the states are run administered by the state and the other half by the federal government, and there can be important differences between the state and federal regulations. NIOSH was created at the same time as OSHA, they're the federal agency responsible for research into new and existing health and safety hazards. They make recommendations to OSHA. They may even recommend a new standard. These are called RELs, Recommended Exposure Limits. Some other agencies we want to talk about. American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists is not a governmental agency. It's a member-based professional society, or NGO, which predates OSHA. It was ACGIH that set the first occupational exposure limits anywhere in the world. These are called threshold limit values, which are updated on an annual basis. <clears throat> Another federal agency is EPA, of course. They come into the health and safety equation with their national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants, or NESHAP. Some other agencies we may want to mention are ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, which is, again, a private nonprofit organization. They administer and develop voluntary standards for conformity to assessment systems. They have a like organization in Canada called the Canadian Standards Association. Now, I'm going to just uh, touch on a few regulations. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I just want to point out some key regulations. 29 Code of Federal Regulations 1910 deal with the uh, health and safety standards. Subpart Q uh, has general uh, standards regarding welding, cutting, and brazing, general information regarding combustible materials, 
um, talk about fire watches, areas where welding is prohibited, etc. There's also standards governing oxy fuel gas welding, of the storage of cylinders, etc. And then the design, installation, and maintenance of arc welding and cutting equipment. Next, CFR 1910 subpart I uh, has a deals with respiratory protection. There's a whole list there that you see. Eye and face protection. This is the standard that talks about filtered lenses and requirements for eye protection. Respiratory protection is a 134. Remember, any company programs on respiratory protection should be based on air quality studies done by industrial hygienists. 135 and 136 talk about head and foot protection, such as falling objects. These are not specific to welding, but cover all types of uh, potential injuries to the head and feet. And then 137, 138, uh, electrical protective equipment and hand protection. 29 CFR 1926 uh, deals with construction. Again, there's sections on general environmental control, gas welding, arc welding, as you see, fire prevention. This is where you get into fire extinguishing equipment and precautions. Subpart 353 talks about ventilation, both general and local exhaust ventilation. Part 354 gets into some of the specifics of uh, coatings and flammable materials that may be present when welding, cutting, and brazing. And again, I referenced the ANSI standards before, ANSI Z491. This uh, talks about safety and welding and cutting, uh, installation and operation of equipment, once again, fire prevention, uh, health protection, and some ventilation standards. Understanding these regulations can help you to assess the hazards in your particular welding, cutting, brazing environment. The first step toward a safer, compliant working environment is to conduct a hazard assessment to identify the potential hazards. It's important to conduct the hazard assessment for each facility, each individual facility, to increase compliance and minimize risk. Remember, the hazards may vary. Um, the environment may be an open outdoor area or may be a confined area. Process differences are important. If we're talking MIG welding versus TIG welding versus sub-arc welding, these are all different levels of hazards. And then there's especially there's differences between operators. The position, the use of ventilation, particular uh, practices of the welder can have a big influence on the welding, cutting, and brazing hazards. The benefits of a hazard assessment are that it provides a solid understanding of the environment, identifies hazards that often go unnoticed by management and operators, and contribute to best-in-class operations, boosting employee morale, attracting and retaining skilled workers, which creates a positive company environment. Remember to use qualified professionals to evaluate the environment in question. Certified industrial hygienists or certified safety professionals offer the best professional practices. These individuals can be found through the insurance company or broker, through private consultants, and don't forget even OSHA has a consultation division and that can provide help with certain questions. At this point, I think I'm going to hand it off to Kathy, who will be taking over um, discussing some best practices. Kathy? Thank you very much, Bert, for giving us a brief introduction on the regulations and the standards that impact welding, cutting, and brazing operations, and the importance of performing hazardous uh, identification and assessment in your compliance process. You know, welding, cutting, and brazing are safe occupations when sufficient measures are taken to protect the welders from the potential hazards they're exposed to. However, there are times when these measures may be overlooked or ignored, and welders can encounter hazards such as fire and explosion, electrical shock, uh, 
overexposure to radiation, fumes, and gases, any of these which may result in illness and fatal injuries. So really the most fundamental practice in minimizing exposures to these hazards that are commonly found in welding, cutting, and brazing applications is how you can effectively manage or control the hazard, the process that occur in the environment, and also the activities of your workers. That will greatly reduce the risk and increase safety and compliance in your programs. So in this section, what we're going to do is we'll explore some of the industry-wide best practices that are used to manage and control most of the predominant hazards in welding, cutting, and brazing. And that really brings us to hazard management and how are you going to be able to accomplish that within your facility settings. Well, once companies have a thorough understanding of the hazards that are present, they must then formulate a plan to minimize or control the worker's exposure to these hazards. OSHA has identified a tiered approach that's called the hierarchy of controls. Uh, this is just a guideline that outlines steps that employers can take to manage a specific hazard. Um, it's also often represented in a pyramid format, indicated that there are methods that can be taken together simultaneously or independently to increase effectiveness and reduce the risk to exposures. It's very common for multiple steps to be deployed at the same time to maximize the best results, not only for increased safety, but also for compliance. And that's primarily the major goal in hazard management. So let's just take a brief moment to look at each one of these steps and briefly describe what they mean and how you can employ these in your facilities. So the first step is process modification or substitution, which eliminates or reduces the hazard by physically removing it. That means that you modify the process, substitute an operation or an element in your welding process for one that has a, a safer means, one that maintains the same functionality but does not produce that hazard. So for example, incorporating a different welding process that produces less fumes, lowering the generation of the fume rate. So this might be achieved by converting your welding process from a short circuit to a pulse. Another example may be changing the base metal to a cleaner material or using electrodes of lower chemical content or even changing your shielding gas to help lower the FGR. Consider using a 7525 mixed gas over 100% CO2, for example. The second step, which is engineering controls, these are methods to control the hazard by making a physical change to the design of your equipment, to the design or use of the process, or the actual environment in the welding area. So for example, here it would be isolating the welding hazard from anyone that could be harmed by exposure to the welding fumes and sparks and radiation. That might be isolation with curtains, uh, ventilation systems, or even robotic welding. These methods remove the hazard from the environment and reduces the worker's exposure. The third step, work practices, or commonly known as administrative controls, are changes to the workplace policy and procedure, kind of the way the people work. We want to limit or prevent the worker's exposure to the hazard, but these methods don't necessarily remove the hazard at all. So implementing safe practices, uh, modifying the welder behavior to help them minimize the exposure to the hazard, uh, for example, training, job scheduling, proper hygiene, are examples of safe work practices. Uh, instructing welders to use preset welding processes, welding in well-ventilated areas, cleaning the surfaces of base metals, routinely inspecting, maintaining equipment, but really the most important administrative control to use would be proper training on body position, equipment positioning, so that the welders themselves can avoid breathing welding fumes and gases by those methods. The last step then in the hierarchy of control, and again, this may be implemented along with other steps, is personal protective equipment. 
personal protective apparel such as flame retardant jackets, uh, heat resistant gloves, welding helmets, grinding face shields, appropriate eye protection for the welding environment, and respiratory protection, and also heat stress products are all part of PPE that is associated with welding, cutting, and brazing operations. So once that you understand how that hierarchy of control can be applied to evaluating your situation within your facility and looking at your different types of processes that provide risk to the employees, let's review some of those predominant hazards and what are some of the best practices that can be implemented to minimize the exposures and reduce that risk in, of injury and illness to your welding operators and the environment. The primary prominent hazards that we're going to be exploring today are fire prevention, electric shock, protection of personnel, health protection and ventilation, confined space, and cylinder storage. Welding and cutting should preferably be done in designated areas which have been designed and constructed to minimize fire risk. Good housekeeping is a key administrative control method that can be used to prevent fires, and fire precautions should be maintained at all times. So where practical, move the work to a designated safe location and make sure that the area is free of any combustible materials. Now be aware that combustible materials in a welding and cutting or brazing environment uh, come in many different forms. In a liquid form, they may be as a gas, an oil, or a paint. As a solid form, could be wood, could be particulates, or paper. And as a gaseous form, as a vapor. Uh, acetylene is commonly used in all of those processes, and that also can be a very combustible material. So consider the combustible properties of the materials that are in your welding and grinding application, even if they're fine dust particles that can be extremely volatile. Uh, for example, aluminum dust can be combustible or explosive if it becomes suspended in the air at the right concentrations. So the key point here is whenever possible, all combustible materials should be kept at least 35 feet away from the welding arc. Now for areas where that are not designated as a welding area, uh, you should obtain a hot work permit authorized by a designated manager or a qualified individual who has inspected this area, making sure to post the signage, clearly label these areas, and also label the areas that are not suitable for welding cutting operations to take place. Well, we all know that welding sparks can cause fires, so one of the other fire preventions is to make sure that we have fire extinguishers nearby, as well as a trained fire watcher assigned to work with the welders to watch where the sparks are flying and what potentials may exist in your welding, cutting, and brazing operation. In fire prevention, um, also there's the possibility for explosion with the release of toxic vapors or fumes from materials that were previously stored in any of containers or tanks or pipes or vessels or drums. So seemingly empty containers might have hidden uh, materials in the crevices and cracks which could release hazardous fumes and when heated by welding or cutting could potential um, have potentials for fire or explosion. So most importantly, welding should not be started on any of these containers until they have been properly prepared for hot work, cleaned and declared safe by the qualified person. Another prominent hazard is flashback fires. Uh, these are caused by inadequate gas flow and typically occur at the ignition of the torch. So make sure that you purge your oxy-fuel systems before lighting the torch to eliminate any flashback fires. And those are some of the best practices in fire prevention. Well, let's move on then to electrical shock. It's one of the most serious and immediate risks to a welder. Contact with anything electrically hot, metal parts, can cause injury or death, not only due to the electrical shock to the body, but also from a fall that may result as a reaction to that shock. Now, electric shocks are divided into two categories, primary voltage and secondary voltage. 
But the most prominent method to protect yourself and the welder from any electrical shock is by insulating yourself from the work and the ground, meaning ensure that proper grounding is in place at all times. So some of the best practices that we have discovered in, to reduce electrical shock is to make sure, number one, you frequently inspect your input power source, the cord, the ground conductor for any damage or fraying or bare wiring, and replace it immediately if damaged. Also, use non-flammable, dry insulating materials or rubber mats, um, plywood to cover the full area to, of contact, with the ground or your work. Keep insulation on all welding equipment and including your guns, the cables, and machines. And keep the welding cables and electrodes dry and in good condition. For the welder themselves, always making sure that they are wearing uh, rubber-soled shoes, that their, material, their protective equipment is dry, hole-free, and that they have proper protection. You know, avoid coiling or looping welding cables around the parts of the body is also a very good practice to reduce electrical shock. When you're maintaining or repairing equipment is when some of the shocks also occur. So there's that increased risk for electrical shock. Make sure that you follow manufacturer's instructions for any equipment maintenance. Ensure again that proper installation, wiring and grounding is performed by a qualified electrician and only have the equipment repaired or worked on by that qualified electrician. When necessary, make sure that you implement all lockout, tagout procedures when maintaining or repairing your equipment. Now, don't touch the electrode or metal parts of the electrode holder directly with skin or with wet gloves or clothing while standing on a wet, ungrounded surface. Keep the cords and cables dry, free of oil and greases, and protect from hot metal and sparks. So this really comes into good housekeeping again, making sure that frequent inspection and replace damaged weld cables when necessary. Another best practice in uh, welding, cutting, and brazing is the protection of the personnel. So as we've discussed previously, maintaining good housekeeping standards is essential to providing best protection of the personnel. It plays a very important part in any welding, cutting, brazing environment. So again, keep all of your welding equipment, machines, and cables located in an area that do not present a hazard to any other personnel. Post the areas as designated welding areas indicating any appropriate eye and face protection that might be applicable for anyone in the nearby area. Protective screens should be made of flammable resistant material, uh, should be positioned to protect persons in adjacent areas to protect them against radiant energy and metal spatter. They may also be required to wear eye protection. Even when the best housekeeping controls are put into place, Welders and cutters and brazers are often exposed to a large number of potential hazards that pose danger and risk throughout their process. You know, today, more than 50% of all welding-related injuries affect the eye and face. And OSHA requires employers to ensure that the employees have the appropriate eye and face protection from uh, flying debris, protect them against metal spatter, radiant energy, and harmful light radiation. So we're trying to protect them, and there are uh, standards such as the ANSI Z87 that should be used in evaluating your applications to make sure that you are selecting and pro appropriately uh, using proper eye protection for your welders. Also make sure that any other equipment that is being worn, such as the helmet, is fitted properly for each one of the users. Never wear filter plates or any other eye protection that's scratched, pitted, or cracked. Make sure that they are replaced immediately when damaged. Exposures to ultraviolet and infrared rays that are created by the welding art can also cause severe burns to the skin as well as the eyes. So it's really important to have the proper protective clothing 
to protect your body from burns, thermal heat, ultraviolet, and infrared rays. So wear fire retardant clothing, your jackets, sleeves, leggings, head coverings that are properly fitted should allow freedom of movement, uh, provide adequate coverage to the body, and protect against the burns and sparks. You know, avoid rolling up the sleeves or wearing pants with cuffs as hot metals and sparks can get stuck in the folds and burn through. Now, keep clothes in good condition and, again, clean of any grease or oil. Uh, dirty or overly worn or damaged clothing with holes and tears might ignite and may burn the skin. Make sure you clean and replace per your manu the manufacturer's recommendations or sooner if it's needed. And noise is also another hazard in welding, cutting, and brazing operations. Uh, results from the welding process and normally from the equipment that's being used. Uh, arc cutting and arc gouging, uh, plasma cutting, and also some oxy fuel processes produce some very high level noise. Chipping and grinding, engine driven, driven generators um, also increase noise levels within the welding area. So to try to control noise levels, try to control them at the source whenever feasible. However, if these control methods fail and bring exposures within allowable limits, personal protective equipment such as earmuffs or hearing protection should also be used. If noise is a prevalent hazard in your area, make sure that the hearing protection is worn and is comfortable to be worn. So let's move on to ventilation. It's a key method used to eliminate or control the hazards of fumes and gases created during the process of welding, cutting, or brazing. So adequate ventilation should be provided for all welding operations, enough such that personnel exposed to these hazards are below the uh, airborne concentration limit. As we spoke before, both OSHA and EPA have regulations regarding environmental and personal exposures for workers. And there are two types of ventilations that are normally used in welding, cutting, and brazing to minimize fume exposures. That's natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation. But controlling and managing fumes from the welding and cutting operations is complex. So there's the composition and the quantity of fumes and gases that are dependent upon the type of metal or the base of material being worked on. So the process and the consumables also being used, meaning the type of welding, the electrode or the wire, the coatings on the work, whether it's painted or galvanized or plated. All of these are going to contribute to the a level of contaminants in that atmosphere as well as the amount of exposure to that contaminant. So the first step in ventilation, really, best practice is air sampling. So air sampling is required to determine the adequate means of ventilation from all of those different contributors that are exposing the welder and the welder's breathing zone. So we need to determine the level of concentrations that the exposure, that the welder is exposed to. And you can use the um, OSHA's hierarchy of controls to determine which is the most appropriate solution to reduce the amount of exposure and also the training to discuss proper body position, proper welding techniques with the employees so that they minimize the amount of exposure they are to the hazards. Also in ventilation, proper hood positioning is a key source for capturing the welding fumes and gases. Mechanical ventilation includes local exhaust or local forced air, such as fans, and general mechanical air movement um, through the facilities. These ventilation devices work very effectively when they're positioned properly to capture the fumes and the gases. That would be at the source of the generation. When ventilation is not um, adequate, or you're not able to lower below the exposure levels, you may need to provide respiratory protection. If so, make sure that the respirators that are being used are NIOSH approved and that they are to protect the welder against the actual contaminant that is produced in the area. Ensure that the respirator wearers are medically cleared to wear the type of respirator that has been selected, 
And then when selecting respirators, that they do fit comfortably underneath the welding helmet and do not block the field of vision for the respirator during the welding process. There is a whole standard on respiratory protection, OSHA 1910.134, which should be followed in any um, opportunity of when respiratory protection is being provided. So let's look on to another hazard, and that would be welding and cutting in confined spaces. Working in confined spaces can be deadly. So welding, cutting, and brazing require some special precautions. Both the owner, employees, and contractors should be familiar with the company's written confined space work program, guidelines that have been um, written and supervised by trained personnel. Confined spaces are areas which lack room for full movement or often lack ventilation. Welding takes place such as in tanks and pipes and tunnels and boilers and the holes of ships and small structural frames or pits. These are all considered confined space areas. So the best method for safety is to remove hazard or toxic materials, provide forced ventilation, and provide a means to turn power off and gas off from inside these areas. So some of the best procedures are to always open all the covers and the vents, never working alone, Always test the air prior to entry and then continuously during the occupied confined space. Make sure that the opening for the entry and exit allows passage of a person using personal protective equipment. And also make sure that you have planned rescue procedures prior to entry. There's also a standard of confined space uh, OSHA's 1910.146, which can be reviewed for additional uh, best practices and uh, standard requirements in working in confined space areas. Cylinder storage also pose a hazard for welders and cutters. Gas cylinders are normally part of the welding process, and we need to treat them carefully. Cylinders that are damaged or charged in excess of their capacity by weight or by pressure can explode. Protect compressed gas cylinders from excessive heat or mechanical shock, from slag, open flames, sparks, and arcs, all that are included in the welding and brazing operations. So designate an area where the cylinders should be stored away from those exposures. Uh, prevent physical damage or any tampering or subject to extreme temperatures. Make sure that the cylinders are standing upright and that there is no potential for them to be knocked over or damaged by falling or passing objects such as forklift trucks or um, other vehicles within the facility. Um, when not in use, make sure that uh, valves are closed and the cylinder caps are put in place. Um, also, compressed gases must have legible markings with the chemical name and the name of the gas. Don't use any of cylinders with any unmarked labeling. And also, cylinders can be very heavy, so use proper handling and lifting techniques to prevent any back injuries or strain. Again, for more information on any of the instructions for compressed gas cylinders, um, or associated equipment, you can refer to the Safe Handling and Compressed Gas, um, the CGA pamphlet, and standards that would be appropriate. So even though in best practices when we uh, implement either the hierarchy of controls or any of these uh, best practices, no matter how well we try to manage that hazard and implement these best practices, there still occur injuries and illnesses. And what Dale is going to do now is Dale is going to cover some of the misconceptions that might be present within the welding, cutting, and brazing operations that might lead to some of these injuries and illnesses. And Dale, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Kathy. All the regulations that Bird has referenced and the best practices that Kathy has highlighted all have the intent to keep all personnel or operators safe with the use of any welding, cutting, and brazing equipment in any environment. 
Even though every operator should be aware of these operational requirements, some misconceptions still do exist in the workplace. We'll describe a few of the things that we've seen, and certainly there's going to be more issues that, will, that do commonly occur that we're going to have time to describe here today. But the first topic is that of eyewear and eye safety. Some misconceptions exist regarding the use of auto-darkening welding helmets. If the helmet doesn't darken, there is still filtering that protects the eyes. Further, proper shade level is necessary when using an oxy-fuel flame. A shade 3 or a shade 5 is the correct lens to use. Sunglasses are not an adequate form of safety eyewear. Eye damage can develop by inadequate eye protection, even with an oxy-fuel flame. Another area that's commonly noticed is that of clothing. Wearing a t-shirt and a welding sleeve is certainly not adequate. All exposed skin needs to be covered by material that's suitable for protection. Obviously, pockets and cuffs can be problematic, both for welding and cutting operations. Statute 1926.353 speaks of proper ventilation and protection. Fumes in particular are in increasing areas of concern. It's still commonplace to see inadequate protection being used regarding the breathing environment. A special concern is the use of welding and cutting equipment in confined spaces. Shielding gas will displace oxygen, requiring the need for ventilation. So does the use of oxy fuel equipment, since the flame is depleting oxygen from the environment as well as from the cylinder. When confined space operations are done, Additional special protective measures need to be used. This may include supplied air coming to the operator. So this represents another need for ventilation, especially when using a torch in a, in a cutting or heating application. Leaks can develop in the oxy-fuel system, especially when the hoses are attached at the torch. It only takes a 2% fuel leak for the atmosphere to become ignitable. With supplied air equipment, the operator may not quickly detect the gas leak. Another statute, 1926.350, speaks to proper operation of gas equipment. And as Cassie spoke about the proper storage and handling of cylinders, in use it isn't just the cylinders that can be mishandled. Obviously, cylinders need to be secured in use and protected from arc spray. The regulators are also a component of the system and another area of some misconception. It's critically important to keep oxygen connections free of oils and debris. Although oxygen doesn't burn, oxygen lowers kindling points and accelerates combustion. Issues such as heat of recompression can occur, causing fire and explosion at the regulator. High pressure oxygen in excess of 2,000 pounds entering the regulator at high velocity builds heat. If anything is combustible, the potential for fire or explosion can happen. And this isn't just theory. We've seen evidence of this many times. The proper handling of, of cylinders and regulators is vital to prevent fire or explosive conditions. Oxygen retention on clothing is another matter. The American Welding Society reports that oxygen can be retained on clothing for up to 24 hours. Another recommended procedure that's frequently overlooked is to purge the torch before lighting. All manufacturers include this recommendation in their owner's manual. And purging simply means to allow gas to flow for a few seconds before the flame is lit, before the flame is lit, and they should be done separately on the oxygen and then the fuel side. The purpose, of course, is to prevent any mixed gas from occurring in the torch system where it doesn't belong. The flame at the torch tip is burning towards the tip. When properly set, a sufficient volume of both fuel and oxygen keep the flame burning at the proper position. If one gas is not present, the other gas can flow backward in the system. Commonly, fuel gas can flow upward on the oxygen side. Conditions called burnbacks or flashbacks can result due to the emission of this step. As time's limited, we can't get into all of the operational details regarding safe use of welding, cutting, and brazing equipment here. But our intent is to highlight the reality that the safety statutes exist for operators' safety, and there are best practices to follow, and that some misconceptions about practices and procedures continue to be seen. 
Should more information be desired, there are many sources available to help on any of these specific topics. At this point, we'll turn it back to Kyle if there's any questions. Excellent. Thank you all for that wonderful presentation. Very informative. Um, let's dive into some of the questions right now. Uh, our first question, I'm going to direct this to Kathy. Um, there's a shop here that they have weld operators who continue to have issues with eye injuries. What are some of the common preventive measures you have seen other companies implement to help reduce or prevent uh, eye injuries from occurring so frequently? And that's a great question, Kyle. And really, I think the very uh, basic foundation is to take a look at what they currently are using and what are the hazards that are creating these injuries. So we really need to go back to, um, you know, what is the hazard and what injuries are, are being um, occurred. So we take a look at the um, ANSI Z87.1 selection for proper face and eye protection based upon um, the, the type of uh, process that is being put into place. So if they're chipping or grinding, maybe they need to implement a better type of eye protection. Or if they're getting uh, radiation uh, burns from exposure to UV or IR, maybe they need to look at the types of shades that are proper, appropriate protection for the type of welding process or the application that they're doing. So there's a lot of different things that they can do to increase their welder safety. I will go back to the proper selection guide and some of the um, look at some of the type of protective equipment that is available there to increase their safety of their employees. Also, training is very important as well, to make sure that they're using their equipment and using it properly. Great, thank you. Um, question directed to, to Dale here um, from a small fab shop that has done some uh, oxy fuel cutting. Uh, there's been some confusion here in regards to flashback arresters. Uh, what is the most effective location of installation? Uh, is that would that be at the torch handle or at the regulator? When it comes to flashback arresters, it becomes the the operator or management's choice as to what location that they would prefer to install the device. Uh, we probably see that the flashback arrester is most commonly installed at the torch, but there is also compelling evidence that the regulator is also a very suitable location. There are no manufacturers that recommend one or the other, but we do typically see that the torch is the most commonly used location for flashback arrestor installation. Okay. Now, uh, Dale, along those same lines, are flashback arresters required to be installed on torches? Uh, and, and if not, should they be? Um, this commenter uh, has heard instances uh, where the regulators have exploded. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, that can happen. The absence of a flashback arrestor would allow fire if that is moving backward in the system and the condition be called flashback. <clears throat> Excuse me. If the fire is moving upward in the system, it can reach the, the regulators and the cylinders. Uh, fire always is following fuel gas upstream as far as there is any. And the regulations do require that a flashback arrestor be installed in the system. Then again, it becomes the operator's choice to where that location will be. Some operations will place a flashback arrestor at both ends of the system. Now, there is another additional concern with that. Although a flashback arrestor does stop and typically extinguish fire, there is also some restrictive nature to the device. Gas flow will be slowed down a little bit because of the nature of the restrictive elements inside of that flashback arrestor. So if large cutting tips are being used, heating tips are being used where high flows are required, some of the restrictive nature of flashback arrestors need to be taken into consideration. So if we've mounted flashback arrestors on both ends of the system, that can contribute to some gas flow problems. Great, thank you. Um, Bert, what about Chromium 6? Uh, what additional steps are required by OSHA? A good question. First of all, I would uh, direct everyone's attention to uh, Code of Federal Regulations 1910.1026, That's the hexavalent chromium standard. Again, when we're talking, actually this standard does pertain to uh, several different industrial processes where hexavalent chromium can be generated 
and where employees can be exposed, included, including chromic acid plating, which is obviously an entirely different set of circumstances. So when you're reading through the standard, you should be aware of which sections of the standard apply to welding, cutting, and brazing. First of all, it's important to do air monitoring. Most of the engineering and administrative controls are triggered by the level of hexavalent chromium that the employee is exposed to. The OSHA PEL is 0.005 milligrams or 5 micrograms per cubic meter. That's very low. I would point out that that's 10 times lower than the standard set for lead. There's an action level of one half of that, 2.5 micrograms per cubic meter. If a welder is exposed over this level for an eight-hour shift, uh, certain administrative controls are required, including medical surveillance and the use of respiratory protection, and engineering controls also would be required. Again, I would direct uh, people to the standard for a fuller explanation of that standard. Certain things uh, in the standard that apply to, say, uh, uh, platers that are exposed to liquid chromic acid, such as the use of protective clothing, are not required for welding. That's not uh, clearly specified in the standard, but uh, additional protective clothing is not required for welders. Great. Thank you, Bert. Uh, Kathy, I was hoping you could touch on um, employer obligations uh, if they allow uh, voluntary respirator use. Are full regulations applicable? Um, that's a great question. Uh, no, they're not. Uh, there is a specific uh, appendix to the uh, respiratory standard by OSHA uh, 1910.134 Appendix D that is going to provide uh, anyone with information regarding mandatory information for employees using respirators when not required under the standard. When not required under the standard means that your uh, exposure levels are below the permissible exposure level for that specific contaminant. So even though respirators are a very effective method of protection against hazards, and they need to be worn properly and selected properly as well, even if you're below the PEL. You know, they may add additional level of comfort for the protections and be offered as a voluntary use. But what you, the employer then needs to do is to make sure that they at least know that the selection of the respiratory is for the specific hazard or exposure. Um, make sure that the employee uh, is understanding the limitations, uh, any cleaning or care that is necessary for wearing of that respirator itself, and then to make sure that it's not being worn in an area where there are other contaminants that they might be exposed to. Uh, and then, you know, the employee needs to make sure that they have proper storage, cleaning, and keep track of their respirators as well. And again, I would just uh, suggest anybody that is offering the use of respiratories as voluntary and not mandated under any exposure level is to check out the requirements in the OSHA 1910.134 Appendix D. Okay, great. We, we do have a couple other questions here about, about voluntary use of respirators, and Kathy, I'm going to send this one your way as well. Uh, how in-depth should the respirator program be when we're talking about voluntary use of respirators, such as an N95 de uh, dust mask? Uh, pr pretty much just what we had talked about is making sure that they they follow all the instructions by the manufacturer on the use, maintenance, and, and uh, cleaning and care of the respirator itself. Uh, choose the respirators that still are certified for the contaminant that they are exposed to, and then to make sure that they're wearing the respirator not in areas where there are other contaminants or other levels that they have of concern. So again, just go back to the Appendix D, and that will tell you uh, of 1910.135, the Appendix D, of what specifics they need to follow if uh, they're using them for voluntary use. Great. Kathy, Thank you. Uh, this is Bert. Uh, let me add something on to that. Uh, even with voluntary usage, uh, people, uh, the work respirator wearer should also fill out Appendix C, which is the medical questionnaire. So medical C, uh, or Appendix C, the medical questionnaire should also be filled out even for voluntary usage. Thank you, Bert. Appreciate the input. So, yeah. so Bert, does that mean that um, uh, if, if an employer does allow voluntary respirators, 
um, and they and they don't fill out Appendix C. They're not filling out that medical surveillance that they could get uh, dinged by OSHA then? Possibly. It would be rare, but it is possible. Remember, if somebody is... Uh has a respiratory hazard, if they have asthma, et cetera, they shouldn't be wearing a respirator. So filling out Appendix C for voluntary use is just simply to screen out those people who shouldn't be wearing a, a respirator. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I apologize that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of the unanswered questions today will be forwarded on to our speakers. Um, and with that, that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Kathy, Dale, Bert. Miller Electric, and everyone who listened in. Thank you all, and have a great day.